Good afternoon. I, I'm Daryl Law from 107.5 Dave Rocks. I uh, host the Morning Buzz with uh, Gail and Jesse every uh, every weekday, Monday to Friday, uh, 5.30 to 9.30. Uh, good afternoon, honored guests, new inductees, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame, we welcome everyone to the 21st annual induction ceremony. Due to the current state of affairs, this is our first virtual ceremony, which has forced us to differentiate from our, our normal practice. In addition, the ceremony is being recorded. It will be available on our website later. I would like to begin with the following recognition. Now, as we gather in these places to honor these inductees, we remember with gratitude that we live, work, and exist on the land that are traditional territories of the neutral, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. We gather on the Haldeman Tract and the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. May we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its peoples. The Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame is a not-for-profit charitable organization and traditionally holds their annual induction ceremony on the first Saturday in May. The eight inductees we are honoring today bring the total number of inductees to 189 since the hall opened in 1996. First, I would like to introduce our honored guests and inductees and ask them to turn on their cameras, please, when I call your name. Mr. Shannon Adshade, City of Cambridge City Councilor. Mr. Carl Kiefer, Waterloo Regional Councilor. Ms. Helen Jowett, Waterloo Regional Councilor. Mr. Brian May, Federal Member of Parliament for Cambridge. Uh, and I now ask the inductees to please turn on their cameras. Our new inductees include Randy Steinman, new inductee Nathan Brannan, new inductee Tim Brent, new inductee representing James Law is his daughter Margaret Stahlbaum, new inductee Mark Lee, new inductee Victoria Moores, and new inductee Paul Ross. Representing the 2015, 16, and 17 Cambridge National Ringette Championship teams, Sherry Adams. I'm hoping everyone's got the cameras open. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our honored guests and new inductees. I now ask the inductees to please turn their cameras off. This is going to be fun. Uh, however, we do have to start here. It is uh, with a sad note that we mentioned the passing of the following esteemed inductees. Gord Renwick, an influential advocate for Canadian hockey, both nationally and internationally. Bob Cunningham, known for his coaching in softball and his dedication to the sports community. Al Findlay, co-founder of the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame. NHL referee, Neil Armstrong. Bob McKnight, a member of the 1960-61 Galt Terriers. Brian Shouldis, a member of the 1969 Galt Nationals, and while not an inductee, but a driving force in the sports community, George Hill. All are sadly missed. I now call on City Councilor Shannon Adshade to say a few words and ask that he now please turns on his camera. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Shannon Adshade, Cambridge City Councilor. I bring greetings and congratulations on behalf of our mayor. Catherine McGarry, of the rest of the City Council and City staff. It's a real honor to be invited to today's induction ceremony where the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame is showcased and some of our amazing athletes and community builders are recognized. Thank you very much and have a great day. And I will uh, now ask uh, Shannon to turn off his camera. I now call on Regional Councillor Carl Kiefer to say a few words and ask that he please turn on his camera. Thanks, Daryl. Sorry about the confusion there. Um, thanks, Daryl, and hello to all our guests, athletes, past inductees, and everyone involved in today's induction ceremony. There's two things that the city of Cambridge and the region of Waterloo have always been blessed with, and that is world-class athletes and world-class people. I want to congratulate all the nominees and inductees in today's ceremony. It has always been an honor to be part of the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame induction ceremonies. I don't think I have missed one since its inception. I do bring greetings from Chair, 
Redmond and Regional Council at, and, and also will my colleague, uh, Councillor Jowett, who speaks next, of course. And finally, I would like to acknowledge and thank Bob Howison and the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame Committee and our MC Darrell Law. Thank you all. Thank you, Carl. And I ask that you turn your, uh, your camera off now. I now call on Regional Councillor Helen Jowett to say a few words and ask that she please turns on her camera. Thanks so much, Daryl. Good to see you got that haircut. You can see that's a lot, a, lot, a lot easier to see those eyes of yours. Hello, everybody. My name is Helen Jowett and I represent Cambridge at the region of Waterloo and also uh, work alongside uh, Carl Kiefer who just spoke. So he's already suggested who are, we're representing. I just wanna celebrate and, and certainly appreciate uh, uh, all of the uh, inductees and the nominees. This is certainly a different way to appreciate uh, your gifts and talents, but Nonetheless, we celebrate them. Uh, your dedication and passion are, are something that puts us on the map and congratulations to you all. We're very, very proud of you. Thank you, Helen. Um, I now call on uh, Mr. Brian May to say a few words and ask that he please turns his camera on. Thank you, Daryl, and hello, everyone. It's uh, it's my pleasure to be here today as we gather together to support the work of the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame and offer my congratulations to all the nominees and winners this year. I hope that uh, all the nominees and winners here today recognize uh, the role that they play in our community and, and what they mean to the people that, that you support. And in, in uh, preparation for today, I, I was uh, reminded of uh, just just a, uh, an event that was hosted um, by the late uh, Frank Montero. If you remember, we had the concert in the park with the Tragically Hip. And what I actually remember about that is, is the CBC actually preempted the Olympics uh, to host, uh, to, to broadcast that. And prior to uh, preempting, and, and, and as we're sitting in the park uh, waiting for the concert to start, it was just amazing to watch uh, uh, inductee Nathan Brennan uh, compete uh, in the Olympics while uh, the broadcaster uh, was, was inductee Mark Lee. And, and I just wanted to share that uh, as something that I will never forget as one of the most Canadian moments of my life. Um, and now as we round the turn on, on what will hopefully be the last major leg of this, uh, this pandemic in Canada, we can hopefully get back uh, to enjoying sports as we normally do. Uh, thank you to the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame uh, for all of your efforts this year to recognize the amazing contributions of these athletes and, uh, and, and contributors to sports and, and keeping the sporting community strong here in Cambridge. Thank you. And I'll ask uh, Brian to turn off his camera. We do love seeing your smiling face though. Now it is my esteemed pleasure to recognize the following individuals and teams. I now ask Nathan Brennan to please turn on his camera. When Nathan Brennan retired, from com competitive running, he had won the respect of competitors the world over. His track and field prowess showed, er showed early when in the 1993 Canamera Games in the nine to, nine to 10 age category, he won the 200 meter, 400 meter, 800 meter, and was on the winning four by 400 meter relay team. In high school, he went on to win nine OFSSA gold medals and a silver and was runner up at the Canadians three times. He ran a sub four minute mile, only the third Canadian high schooler and just the seventh junior in North America to do so. In his senior year, he ran the senior national championships as an 18 year old and finished second in the 800 meter. He broke the Canadian junior record by nearly one full second. As he closed out his high, his high school career in 2001, Brandon was ranked fifth in the world in the 800 meter and 10th in the world in the 1500 meter. He was one of the greatest high school athletes in Canadian history. During Brandon's four years at the University of Michigan, the 800 became his specialty. He regarded his four years at Michigan as some of the best of his life. Another plus is that was where he met his future wife, Teresa. When people ask about the biggest thing he ever did in his career, he usually mentions the Olympics. But said the biggest thing I always remember is winning the NCAAs for the very first time. 
After that, he went on to win four NCAA titles, was an All-American 11 times, three in cross country and eight on track. He also broke two world records there as part of a relay team. An injury prevented Brandon from competing in the 2004 Olympics. And then in 2007, he had back surgery, which prevented him from running for two months. In July 2007, he qualified for the 2008 Olympics. When I got to China, I was ready to go and I felt 100%. I ran great in the first round, but was so excited I couldn't sleep and struggled in the semi and missed the final by three positions. That was tough, said Brandon. Going into the London Olympics in 2012, he had won 11 of his previous 12 races and had broken the Olympic standard numerous times. In the, semi, in the semifinal, Brandon and others and another runner tangled legs and he fell to the track. Falling at such a big event was tough and I'm still not over it to this day, said Brandon. In the Rio Olympics, Brandon finished 10th and was the oldest runner in the field. Retiring in 2018, Brandon had run almost 13 years as a professional and during that time, the lowest he was ever ranked was 20th in the world. At the time of his retirement, he held four Canadian track and field records in the indoor and outdoor, 1,000 meter and 2,000 meter and the indoor one mile. Brandon says, I continue to run, but if I get up one day and I don't wanna run, I don't have to. But more importantly, I'm not on the road and away from my wife, Teresa and children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 2020 inductee into the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame, Nathan Brannan. And I ask Nathan that you please turn on your microphone. Thank you very much for that. Um, I didn't realize I was going first. I thought I was actually second. <laughs> but um, I want to say uh, first, just thanks to the committee. Um, I actually did an interview the other day about being inducted into the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame. And one thing I told the, the person I was talking to is that this, this is probably one of the, the special, most special things that I've ever had in my career. Um, making the Olympics is obviously a big deal, winning national championships, but having the recognition of my hometown has always just meant the world to me. Um, spent the first 18 years of my life there, have uh, a lot of great mem memories. Um, and it's, it, it just means a lot to know that I have that much support back home. Um, and also congratulations to the other inductees. Um, we kinda, in my household, we have a running joke with me and my wife. She's been inducted into three sports hall, sports hall of fames now. And so this makes my fourth and I finally moved to the, the most recognized, I guess, athlete in, in the house. So I have that over her. So it makes me feel pretty good, but um, <clears throat> It's, it's an interesting year this year. We're, we're dealing with the pandemic and um, I, most of you guys know I have two kids at home. Um, and so I'm kind of playing daddy duty today while I'm being inducted to, into the, the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame. So at two o'clock, I have to actually get off here early to get my daughter from softball, go get my son um, from a birthday party this afternoon. My wife's a realtor, she's out working, so. Uh, for 13 years, it was life as a professional athlete and, and running all over the world. Now it's, it's daddy has to do whatever daddy needs to do to, to get the kids where they need to go. So it's a, definitely a different part of my life, a different position and, and putting on a, a different hat. But um, I'm really thankful for what running gave me. Obviously, it let me go on to the University of Michigan on a full athletic scholarship, meet my wife. Um, ran professionally for 13 years, got to do what I love. Um, but the, the biggest thing I, I, I get asked a lot from people like what got me to the, the next level and, and what allowed my career to be so long. Um, everyone that's ever probably been inducted as, as an athlete can say that obviously talent in the sport is one thing that separates them, but the, the willingness to, to work that much harder than everyone else and, and just dig a little bit deeper is what usually separates um, the good from the great. Um, but the other thing is, is good coaching. Um, and I'll, I'll be the first to always say that I probably wouldn't be where I am today without the, the mentors and coaches I had along the route. Um, starting back in seventh and eighth grade with Pieker and Berg's tri Tricycle Track Club. So, in my opinion, a coach isn't just coaching you in the sport. It's, it's someone that helps bring out the best in, in each athlete. And, and that's exactly what 
Pete did. He allowed me to see the talent that I had. Um, I could have taken many routes in, in high school and, and, and luckily he saw the potential in me and kept kind of hounding me to, to, to really focus on it. And um, back when I was nine, 10, 11 years old, I wish I was in, in, in Tim Brent's shoes because I, I thought I wanted to be, well, I, I did want to be a professional hockey player, but at five foot nine, I am now and 130 pounds. That was a uh, long lived back a long time ago, but um, I thought I was going to be a hockey player through the ninth grade and I was, I was okay. And my coach was like, Nate, you need to give that up and, and really focus on, on running. And so luckily Pete was kind of steered me in that right direction. And then I had a great coach in high school with uh, Bill Horwich um, and then on to the university of Michigan with Ron Warhurst. And then I finally ended my career with uh, one of the Canadian Olympic team coaches win uh, Gimitrowski. So I was just really lucky to have a great group of coaches that steered me in the right direction, always were um, super positive role models and, and allowed me to, to be the athlete I was. So um, a big part of this is, is thanking them. Um, and the other thing is, is thanking my, my family for the support and obviously my hometown. So when I, when I talk family, that includes everyone in Cambridge because it, it is one big, big family there. Um, it's funny because I always talk about my hometown and how good the athletes are that come through and how many professional hockey players we've had or professional or Olympians that have gone on to, to the Olympics and other sports. And it's crazy to think that a town of, I don't know what Cambridge is now, 130,000. I think it was like 90,000 when I lived there. A town that I think is, is relatively small has had such success um, in sport. And, and it's amazing to see and, and be part of and and now be inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame with so, so many amazing other athletes and people. So um, I'll end with that. I just want to say thank you again for allowing me to be part of this and be inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame with so many amazing other, other athletes. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, now I'm back in order. <laughs> you know, you were supposed to go second. Didn't mean to throw you the curveball there. Uh, I now call on Randy Steinman to turn on his camera. Preston native Randy Steinman spent 40 years in radio and television as, a, as an announcer, sportscaster, and news reporter. Steinman remembers having a strong interest in the media as early as the age of 12 while attending William G. Davis Public School. And indeed, he did his first play-by-play -play commentary during a staff student game in grade eight. In those years, he listened to the hockey broadcast from KMOX in St. Louis on his transistor radio. He fondly remembers the voice of play-by-play -play man Dan Kelly, a Canadian from Ottawa. After graduating from Preston High School, Steinman entered Conestoga College as one of 25 students accepted annually into what was regarded as one of the top broadcast journalism programs in the country. In 1979, he was hired by program director Laird Elcombe at CFTJ Radio in Cambridge as an overnight announcer and then moved to CKKW and CFCA, CFCA FM in Kitchener in 1980. What, buddy? Two years later? Grayson, what'd you say? Two, two years later, uh, he moved on there. and uh, he began his sports uh, casting career with the Cambridge Hornets games. It was the first big thrill of my sports casting career, said Steinman. The following season, Steinman moved to Seajoy in Guelph to broadcast the games of the city's new OHL team, the Platters. He was content in radio because it was almost impossible for young Canadian journalists to crack into television back then, said Steinman. However, on impulse, he sent out 104 radio demo tapes across the country. Three months later, news director Mike Lapointe from CFCO News Radio offered him a job in Chatham, only an hour from downtown wow. Detroit. For six years, he worked both sides of the border as a sports reporter out of Southern Ontario and a news radio sports correspondent in Detroit, where he managed, managed the uh, Detroit uh, manager, the Detroit Tigers, Sparky Anderson, were on first name basis. At one Tigers game in late September 1989, he was sitting beside Bill Incall, longtime sports director at CKCO TV in Kitchener. They caught up on old, for old times, and two months later, Big Bill Incall called and said, he had an opening in his television sports department. Steinman auditioned, got the job, and started working there in December of 1989. For the next 30 years, Steinman was a familiar face for Cambridge and KW residents, as well as viewers throughout Southwestern Ontario. 
1997, Steinman was named the TV sports director and held that position for 20 years. During that time, he wrote four books. His first was titled Crowded Maze, and the final one was co-authored by with uh, then 10-year-old, his 10-year-old son. His career included many memorable interviews, including notably Bobby Orr, NFL Hall of Famer Johnny Unitas, Major League Baseball legends Bob Feller and Fergie Jenkins, manager Sparky Anderson, Mr. Hockey Gordie Howe, and Tigers uh, announcer Ernie Harwell. Between 1998 and 2001, Steinman returned to Conestoga's TV and radio broadcasting classrooms as a part-time teacher. He coached and mentored anchors and reporters throughout the U.S. After corporate cutbacks eliminated CTV sports departments in 2017, Steinman finished his career as an award-winning feature news reporter, claiming national RTN DNA awards for three consecutive years. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 2020 inductee into the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame, Randy Steinman. And I ask uh, Randy to please turn your microphone on. Thanks, Daryl. I think it. I think it is. Um, Daryl, when you said we you were supposed to get a haircut today, I, I thought you were serious. So I, I may have taken it a little bit too far, but uh, thank you for that great, uh, great introduction. Um, and I want to thank all of the uh, the, the, the committee and uh, and uh, congratulate the fellow inductees for this great honor today. Um, I'm going to do something a little unorthodox and. I, I'm going to talk a little at the beginning here about the worst day of my career. Um, and that was March 28th, 2017. Daryl had just alluded to it when, when uh, CTV made a lot of cutbacks, but it was a little over four years ago. And um, March was a, always a real busy time of year for us at the sports department at the TV station because there was so much going on. There was OHL playoffs. There was junior B, junior C playoffs. There was OFSA, basketball, volleyball, uh, CIS University, national championships. The turbos were uh, always off playing somewhere at a national championship. So it was a real busy time. And one morning, um, uh, my boss came to my door uh, and said, can you come upstairs to the boardroom for a few minutes? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm slammed here, but sure, I can you know, come up for maybe five minutes. So as I'm going upstairs to this boardroom and I'm thinking, I wonder what this is all about. I thought they're going to tell me that I won a national award because I knew I was a finalist for an RTDNA award on a, on a story I had done about some regional um, blind curlers. So I thought I'm going to walk into this boardroom and there are going to be a, a dozen colleagues with party hats and and noisemakers and cupcakes congratulating me, and I, I better act surprised. So I turned the corner to go into the boardroom, and instead of a party waiting for me, uh, there were three people sitting there with papers all spread out and, you know, sad puppy dog looks on their faces. And uh, basically, I was, I was told that uh, my department was being eliminated <laughs> and uh, my 38 year career as a sportscaster was ending. And that was pretty tough to take. It was a tough day. Um, fortunately, uh, they, they did give me a chance to stay on as a, as a news reporter. Um, and I had a couple of days to decide to do that. Um, and in those two days, I thought about a lot of things. And I thought about you know, how important this, this whole community was to me, having grown up here in Preston and uh, having played minor hockey for Preston, uh, you know, seeing the arena burn down in 1971, which was tough, uh, playing uh, uh, football and track at, at Preston High School, um, being interviewed by Carl Fletcher when I was about 16 years old, which was, you know, just a great honor and a thrill. Um, uh, going to uh, Jester's games and, and Preston Raiders games and Terriers baseball games and, and um, Hornets games and later doing Hornets on the radio and, and being part of that Allen Cup win in 1983. Uh, I, I thought about all those things, all the, all the people that we um, really tried to make household names with our sports casts over the years. And I, and I think, I, I think we helped do that. Um, like, you know, Yvonne Tusick and, and um, um, Ian Leggett, Brian Little, Tim Brent, Nathan Brannon, 
who are here today, uh, um, Scott Thorman, Kirk Maltby, people like that. Um, that was all so important. And, and I was really happy to be able to stay on for a couple more years and, uh, and, and still contribute to the, the sports community as best I could. Um, I did a, a story on uh, um, the uh, Jacob Hessler football program and the great success that it had had over the years. Uh, I was really thrilled to do a, a story on uh, the, the history of the Galt Arena and the legacy that that building has. Uh, because stories like that are so important to, to keep the history alive and to, to always tell those important community stories because without media, um, that stuff, that, those stories don't get told. And uh, 20, 30, 40 years from now, there's no history of those stories. And that's why it's so important. But um, it, it's funny that the, the, that day was su such a, a, a bad day for me. Um, and it was the low point. Um, but here's, here's the good news about a week after that day on March, 2017, that, um, that award that I was telling you about that I was hoping to win a week later, I won that award. And, and I liked that win so much that a year later, I won another one. And, and a year later, I, I, I won another one and just telling local stories. Um, it was sort of my passion and I love doing it. And I'm so proud that I had a chance to do it. And, you know, as March 28th, 2017 was the low uh, today, <laughs> May 1st, 2021, truly one of the one of the highlights. I mean, this is such an honor and such a thrill to be um, inducted into this Hall of Fame with uh, all of these these great people. Um, and, and it includes names of, of people, people who were who were heroes when I was a little kid growing up in Preston. So to be a part of this now is, is such an honor. And I thank the committee and I thank you. And uh, I really appreciate having been a part of this sports community uh, for all my life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Randy. Uh, yes, and the haircut looks fantastic. Uh, I look like Doc Brown from Back, Back to the Future. So my wife told me I either got it cut or I was sleeping in the garage. So. There we go. Congratulations. Uh, I now ask Tim Brent to please turn on his camera. Tim Brent grew up in Cambridge playing hockey and baseball and uh, was almost as good a, bit at a ball player as he was a hockey player, but hockey won out. When starting to skate at the age of two at the old Hespler Memorial Arena, his parents, Ian and Rhonda, recall him getting frustrated his first time on the ice. He liked going fast and everybody was passing him. But the next year, he was skating in, an, in earnest, and away he went. In those early years, he played mini sticks. From time to time, he woke up uh, until the time he went to bed, playing hockey. Grandma or anyone else was uh, the goalie, recalls his father, Ian. His mother, Rhonda, said that my mom used to put catalogs on her legs with elastics, and they'd go downstairs in the basement, and he would shoot pucks at her. At age 15, Tim signed with the Cambridge Winterhawks Junior B hockey team of the OHA. Midwestern Hockey League for the 1999-2000 season, Brent had a strong year and was taken second overall in the OHL's priority selection draft by the Toronto St. Michael's Majors. As a junior, he was selected to play in the annual CHL-NHL Top Prospects game for Team Orr against Don Cherry's team, but was unable to play due to injury. Tim was disappointed, but received a personal call from Bobby Orr, who told him not to worry. For his part, Don Cherry was always a fan of Tim's, likening him to an old style player. In 2004, Brent played for Canada at the World Junior Under 20 Championships in Finland with Canada winning a silver medal. Brent had an impressive junior career, was drafted 37th overall by the NHL's Anaheim Mighty Ducks, but did not sign with them that year and went back into the draft the following year, again, selected by Anaheim. In 2004-2005 season, he played for the Cincinnati Mighty Ducks, but was called up and played 18 games for Anaheim in the NHL. The following year, he started playing with Anaheim's new minor league affiliate, the Portland Pirates, but was again recalled to play for the Stanley Cup winning Ducks, scored his first NHL goal on February 20th in a game against the Vancouver Canucks. He received a Stanley Cup ring that year. For the next couple of seasons, he was on the move after being traded to the Pittsburgh Penguins in 2007 and to the Chicago Blackhawks the following year. One of the highlights of his career came on July 6, 2009, when he was signed by the Toronto Maple Leafs. 
During his first preseason game, he tore his pectoral muscle requiring surgery, surgery that would see him miss four months of action. Following his recovery, he returned to play with the Toronto Marlies, scoring 28 points in 33 games. He was called up for the final game of the season to make his debut with the Leafs against the Montreal Canadiens. A strong training campaign the next year with Toronto saw Brent dress for the Maple Leafs in the season opener on October 7, 2010 against, again, the Montreal Canadiens. His impact was immediate, scoring the first goal of the game. In the next season, a, spectac a spectacular shift earned him a nomination for the NHL Player of the Year. In a game against the Carolina Hurricanes, he blocked five shots, cleared the puck from his end in a single penalty kill. He also received a standing ovation at the Air Canada Centre, as well as TSN's No Guts, No Glory Award. The following season, he moved to the Carolina Hurricanes, signing a two-year contract on July 1st, 2011, followed by a one-year stint in 2013 in the KHL in Russia, where his team won the Gagarian Cup. While in Russia, he also played for, the, for Canada in the Spangler Cup. Following the 2014-15 season, he returned to North America, signing with the Philadelphia Flyers, where he played for their AHL affiliate, the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. On May 25, 2016, Brent announced his retirement from professional hockey. Uh, uh, over the course of his career, he played more than 850 games in the pros, of which 207 games were in the NHL. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 2020 inductee into the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame, Tim Brent. And I asked Tim now if you would please turn on your mic and your camera. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, thank you for this great honor. Uh, Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame committee members, uh, this is extremely appreciated and um, just can't tell you how much this means to me and, and my family. Um, also want to thank the, the dignitaries here on, on the, the uh, Zoom call or the, uh, um, the ceremony today. Uh, you know, at times like this, we, we appreciate how hard your job is to keep Cambridge a great place to live and uh, a great place to raise a family. So, um, so thank you. And ceremonies like this, it, it, you know, um, it's no doubt that sport continues to be a priority uh, for our city and region. And I'm ver very thankful for that. Um, congrats to all the, the inductees. Uh, great honor. I've, I've got to read through uh, all of your accomplishments and uh, everybody here has, has a lot to be proud of. So congratulations. Um, <clears throat> I think the best thing about these ceremonies uh, are it's a great it's a great time to be able to thank people that maybe don't always get thanked and um, you know we we don't sit here being inducted into our hometown hall of fame uh, by doing by doing things on our own so uh, I'd like to start by thanking Hesper Minor Hockey um, you know that's where everything started for me. Uh, followed by Cambridge Minor Hockey and obviously the, the Cambridge Winterhawk Junior B organization. Um, I can sit here today and reminisce on my career and the majority of my most fond memories of playing hockey um, were while I was playing with my best friends in my hometown. So um, I have just the best, best memories of uh, winning a junior B championship with the Winterhawks and, um, you know, the, the, the guys that I got to do that with, uh, just made it that much more special. Um, I want to thank my coaches, uh, and I think it's very important that I thank all of my coaches, meaning my hockey coaches, my baseball coaches, uh, you know, the teachers that donated time after school to, to have basketball teams and volleyball teams and football teams and track programs. Um, I truly believe that being an athlete allowed me to be the best hockey player I could be. Um, I don't think I would have succeeded in taking the next step in my career and eventually reaching, you know, my goal of playing in the NHL um, without playing a, a lot of different sports. Uh, I think it allowed me to, um, 
to change my game and 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 fit a need for um, for teams like the Toronto Maple Leafs. So I'm, I'm very thankful to all the coaches that uh, have ha had a hand in me becoming um, my my best self as an athlete. <clears throat> Hockey, in my opinion, is is the ultimate ultimate team sport. So I, I would be remiss uh, not to thank all of my former teammates. Um, chances are I learned something from you. Um, I was successful because of you. And uh, again, each of you had a hand in me reaching my goal of playing in the NHL. So so thank you to to all of my teammates. Truly, from the from the bottom of my heart. Um, I want to thank the game of hockey. Uh, it has given me and my family so much. Um, you know, I got to travel to places that I wouldn't have otherwise traveled to, meet people that I wouldn't have otherwise met, and um, gained some real strong friendships uh, through the game. So um, I'm, I'm very grateful to the game of hockey and, and the opportunity to play as long as I did. Um, and then the most obvious is, is thanking my family. Uh, my sister, Tanya, uh, she got dragged to every sporting event, every hockey tournament or baseball tournament all over God's creation. So uh, thank her for not still holding that against me. Um, thank my, my grandparents who, um, with exception of my, my dad's mom, are, are all past now, but we're all uh, a major part of my life and um, we're always at games and taking me to practices or helping my parents when my sister was going one way and, and I needed to go another. Um, I wanna thank my wife, Eva. She, we met uh, later in my hockey career, but um, she did move to Russia with me, which I can promise you that's love if, if you, uh, you move, move to Magnitogorsk, um, that's love. So thank you to her. And then last but not least, I wanna thank my parents. Um, the sacrifices that they made for me to pursue my dream are really immeasurable. Um, you know, I can, I can sit here today and think about all the things that I went through through my hockey career and, um, you know, the example that they set um, allowed for easy decisions for me, um, whether it was having to work harder than than everybody else or sacrifice something to make sure that I put myself in the best position to um, to be the best player I could be. Um, and really to be able to show character when character was needed and um, I just got to watch that every day at home. So uh, it was always easy for me to, to make those right decisions. And um, I'm very thankful for, for having that kind of support. Um, so, you know, I think for me, um, this is such a huge honor. Uh, everybody on this call, everybody um, understands that, you know, it takes a village to raise a, a kid. Well, I would say it takes a region to raise an athlete because, um, I know how much uh, I know how much goes into it. So thank you to everybody again. Thank you to the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame for for such a great honor. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I now ask Mrs. Margaret Stahlbaum to please turn her camera on. James Law was one of the best lawn bowl bowlers of his era and was inducted into the Ontario Lawn Bowling Association Hall of Fame in 2018. Born in Galt in 1912, he attended Galt Collegiate Institute, but left before graduation. The story of his departure from GCI was similar to that of another Hall of Famer, Dr. Harry McKendrick. In McKendrick's case, Headmaster Tassie chased him out of the school, uh, chased him right out of the school. In Law's case, so the story is told, it was Principal H. Walton who chased Law out of the school, the Dando Street exit to be exact, and that Law never returned. A lifelong resident of the area, he owned and operated Law Cartage Limited of Cambridge, but it was as a lawn bowler that he earned his athletic distinction, earning provincial and Canadian championships. In his introduction at the Ontario Hall of Fame, it said, 
due to a combination of 173 qualifying points and being one of the great skips of his period, the OLBA is proud to induct Jim Law as a legacy player into the OLBA Hall of Fame class of 2018. Law, whose career spanned more than four decades from the 1950s, was one of the most prolific winners in the annals of the Ontario lawn bowling circuit. His career of district championship spanned from 1956 to 1991. Jim was always helpful to others who wanted to learn from him, said his friend Dave Burroughs. He was also the winningest fours skip of his day and was able to save games, provide back bowls, drive his own jacks, and help his team in many ways. He was just the, very modest about it. Uh, one day, Burroughs asked him, asked him, Jim, how to beat a fellow bowler, oh, Joe Dorsch. Joe has one strategy, replied Law. That is to use his final bowls, if necessary, to drive the jack into the ditch to score. Therefore, when I play Joe, I instruct my, my lead to play their first bowl as close to the ditch as possible without going in. Joe usually gets a bit depressed after that. Burroughs also called asking Law how important the skip was is to his team in fours. The skip is the least important player on a fours team, said Law. If a skip is down when he comes up to play each end, you will lose anyway. Jim was also a mentor to both Bill Botger and George Boxwell as they moved up the competitive ranks of bowls. Jim was very forthcoming to anyone who wished to learn the strategy of the game, which at the time was considered very generous. Law's Ontario Hall of Fame credentials include 33 district, 33 district, seven titles, 10 Ontario championships, and four Canadian championships. His dominance in fours was outstanding, accounting for 21 districts, eight Ontario titles, and three national titles. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 2020 inductee into the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame, James Law, and I now call upon his daughter, Margaret Stahlbaum, to speak on his behalf when she turns her mic on. Thank you for honoring my father, Jim Law, with his recognition of his lawn bowling accomplishments. Many of today's inductees are people that I watch compete in their sport as well, but my dad would consider it such a privilege to be included in the level of excellence that these, uh, these current and the former Cambridge inductees have exhibited. Uh, my dad was fascinated with lawn bowling as a child as he watched his father, Samuel Law, who at the time also bore a reputation as one of Canada's outstanding lawn bowlers. And his dad had a great influence over him as his skills were being developed. He won his first tournament at the age of 15. Um, I remember as a kid, my dad telling me that Ontario was divided up into districts in the sport of lawn bowling. And my dad bowled out of this region and it was in the district number seven. And it was considered the uh, highest caliber of competition. My dad studied all of the things that makes uh, lawn bowling a great sport. He'd be aware of how the weather would affect the grass. He learned about the specialized technique of how the cut of the grass impacted the bowls. And as he traveled across North America bowling, he, le he soon learned how different um, artificial turf was to natural grass. And as tournaments ended, my dad would research his opponents for future games and would remember their bowling strengths and would adjust his game to be able to play the game as much to his advantage as possible. And he did all of this before there was Google to do any research. Um, over the years, my father has been nominated for the first Tim Turo Sports Award. He's received a Kitchener Athletic Award, uh, inducted into the Waterloo County Hall of Fame, and was the inaugural inductee for the Ontario Lawn Bowls Association. Um, one of the highlights of my dad's bowling career, though, was when he was named to the Canadian team and became involved in coaching. He, uh, he was a pioneer in the certification program of lawn bowling, specializing in the areas of tactics and strategy. As the youngest of my dad's four children, he, my mom, and often my brother Bill, that also bowled with my dad, would travel across Canada and the U.S. The bowling attire at the time was a crisp white shirt and white pants. My dad proudly ensured that his team always wore the Galt Sportsman's Club crest sewn on the pocket of the shirt. Lawn bowling was often seen as an older person's sport, but my dad would scout young players and would mentor them and instill a love for the game just like he had. These young men like my brother Bill and others in our region like Bill Betker as mentioned earlier and George Boxwell and David Wicks were mentored by my dad and also have winning legacies and my dad was very proud to be part of their journeys. At many of the tournaments, I got to be the unofficial scorekeeper. 
uh, my dad said he'd rely on me to let him know what the score was when he asked. And, but now, <laughs> as a grown up, I realize now that it was his way of keeping track of a child in an unfamiliar setting in a different city. But as a child, I'd probably say, Dad, your team is winning. And he'd turn to me and he'd say, Margaret, you always play like you're losing by one. You keep trying to get one more. Well, 1991 was the last year my dad had won a title, but it was also the year he was diagnosed with cancer. And on his 80th birthday in February of 1992, you know what my dad said, I just want one more. He didn't get that next birthday, but he left us with so many memories and his families and friends um, always had one more story to tell about Jim Law. But today I proudly accept, accept this acknowledgement of James Law, one of Canada's best lawn bowlers, as he is inducted into the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame. What a thrill it will be when we get to go to the Cambridge Centre and are able to point out to our family's younger generations the connection of a great city to our family's heritage. So thank you Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame Committee for making this a very special day for our family. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to now call on uh, Mr. Dave Maneri to please turn his camera on, who will be representing Mark Lee. Mark Lee developed an early interest in radio, thanks largely to his father, who was a radio program director and announcer. He would often tag along with his father. Entering Carleton University, Carleton University's highly regarded school of journalism, he did some part-time radio work on weekends and summers. His dad, who helped him along the way, made sure he paid his dues. He was a great teacher and mentor and made me realize that nothing is handed to you in life and you have to work hard, said Lee. And he added, I didn't get paid really well at first and uh, worked some pretty lousy shifts, but it was a great experience and I got to be around some really talented broadcasters. After graduation, he took a job in Montreal at CFCF Radio. and Within a year, he was working radio news for CBC's National Newsroom in Toronto. Lee worked there for nearly four years before moving into the National Sports Department, where he did reporting and began covering the Olympics beginning in 1984 in L.A. In the following year, he moved on to the Inside Track program, an award-winning CBC radio program of sports and documentaries and in-depth interviews. Lee won two actor awards for the Inside Track. The Foster Hewitt Award for Excellence in Sports Broadcasting was presented annually by ACTRA to honor outstanding work by Canadian television and radio sportscasters. In 1982, he moved into television when the head of CBC Sports offered him a job in Winnipeg. Lee enjoyed doing some serious stories and not just sports highlights about the Blue Bombers and Jets. We did a three-part series called The Spirit of the Game, which ended up on the, on the National and won a Gemini Award. He won a second Gemini Award in 2011 for Best Play-by-Play. -play. Five years later, he returned to Toronto doing live event coverage, doing play-by-play -play and hosting of the CFL and Hockey Night in Canada. His summer sports were indoor and beach volleyball, and in 2008, he covered track and field at the Beijing Olympics. In 2019, CBC Radio aired a retrospective, retrospective broadcast called Backstory, the story behind Lee's exclusive 1987 interview with Muhammad Ali and radio documentary on the three-time heavyweight boxing champ who was in decline with Parkinson's disease. Being a broadcaster also came in handy one day when Olympic runner Carmen Durma, a Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame inductee, was racing in Europe. Lee was calling that race for CBC and something happened with the broadcast whereby CBC News had to break into their programming in Ontario and Quebec and so unfortunately, her parents were unable to see her race. He had been corresponding with the, the Duma family for background research and knew where they lived in Hespler. He asked one of the, the technicians to make a video copy of the race. Lee said, I got off the air and when we finished the show, I got the tape, drove home to Cambridge and went straight to the Duma house and gave them the tape of their daughter's race. Living in Cambridge, he has had, he has had fun with his three children over the years, calling live play-by-play -play over the loudspeakers of the Waterloo Region Elementary School track meets, doing the team introductions at the Day of Champions for Cambridge Minor Hockey Finals, and the annual Cambridge Roadrunners Girls Hockey Tournaments. All told, Lee covered 20 Grey Cup games, four on CBC Radio and 16 on CBC TV, and was host of Hockey Night in Canada for 16 years. The Tokyo Olympics will be his 15th Olympics. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 2020 inductee into the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame, 
Mark Lee, and I now uh, call upon Dave Maneri to speak on Mark Lee's behalf. Will you turn on your mic and camera, please? Thank you very much, Daryl. Um, and uh, what a wonderful tribute to Mark. Uh, Mark uh, can't be here today. He did want me to uh, pass along a few words, though. And uh, uh, the first and foremost, of course, he wants to congratulate his fellow inductees this year. Um, and that was a great story about Carmen Duma. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know he's got connections with uh, some of the inductees and, and, uh, and uh, he admires them all. Um, the, uh, he's, this, he's semi-retired now, but, uh, you know, that being said, one of the, his commitments was this weekend, as it turned out, and he's calling the World Relays this weekend from the CBC Broadcast Studios in Toronto. Um, the, uh, the event's taking place in Poland, Canada, and the U.S., and then Australia and other countries are supposed to be there. Uh, some of those countries, including Canada and the U.S., are, are not because of COVID restrictions right now. Uh, but let me just go back to, he grew up in Ottawa, and, and, and as Daryl mentioned, he idolized his father, who was a longtime broadcaster uh, in radio. And so he'd tag along and uh, go to the, the studio on weekends and, and so forth, and he'd cut the grass there. And, and finally, he, after doing some odd jobs, he, he got a chance to dub some commercials there and, and as a teenager. And then he got on the air when he was in grade 12 and he did a sports cast at 11 o'clock uh, on a Saturday night. And he said no one was listening then, and, um, but, but he loved it. And he started learning how to do things. He made lots of mistakes along the way, he said, and, and so forth. Went to, Ryer, or to uh, uh, Carleton uh, in journalism and he played quarterback uh, for the Carleton Ravens there. Some, has some great stories about all that. When he graduated, he, he took a job at, at CFCF in Montreal, and then it was on to CBC Radio for a dozen years in sports, and, and that's where he covered his first Olympics in 1984 in L.A. He was only 27 years old at the time. Uh, this summer in, in Tokyo, if all goes well, uh, it's going to be, as Daryl mentioned, his 15th Olympics uh, for CBC. But the highlight of his radio career was hosting a, this in-depth sports documentary and interview program, The Inside Track. And uh, it was there that he had this exclusive interview with Muhammad Ali. And I won't relate it now. It's a great story. If you have an opportunity to read the induction booklet in the program, it's, it's on his plaque in his bio there. And I encourage you to read it because it's, it's really quite remarkable and, and, and fun to, 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 to read that. Uh, but that was certainly a highlight, Muhammad Ali. Um, and he's also been able to go into the inner sanctum of the International Olympic Committee in Europe and, and, and has been blessed to travel the world telling these stories, these sports stories about Canadians and, and so forth. In 1992, he, he made the move to TV, and, and that meant that he had to move to Winnipeg with his wife, Carol, and, and they had a, an 18-month-old son, Dane, at the time. And that's really where he learned the ropes in TV. And um, then eventually, he, they, their family grew. They had three children. He moved back to Cambridge, back east of Cambridge, the first time in Cambridge. Uh, and uh, that's when he began a, a full-time job with CTV, a, a TV sports based in Toronto. And uh, um, the, the reason they chose Cambridge was Waterloo Region felt like about the same size as Winnipeg. And it was close to the airport. They liked the, the region. They liked Cambridge. And they thought this would be a great place to, to raise their family. Since then, he's been fortunate to, to do all sorts of things. You know, Daryl mentioned Hockey Night in Canada um, and play-by-play -play there. He's done the CFL on, on CBC, uh, the Calgary Stampede, the Briar, the Scotties Tournament of Hearts, and uh, the Rhodes the Olympic Games. Done multiple world uh, championships in, in all sorts of sports, figure skating, track and field, curling, uh, bobsleigh. And as I mentioned, even though he's semi-retired and, and it was just his real regret that he wasn't able to join you, uh, us today. And uh, it was 23 years ago when they came to Cambridge and, and he said, it's just such a wonderful place to raise his kids and his family to, to live. Um, and it's a short commute to the airport where he goes away on assignments and, and, and so forth. Um, he's also enjoyed doing some things in the community, and we've been fortunate to have him do these things, but he's certainly volunteered with the Cambridge Roadrunners. 
when his daughter uh, was playing hockey and, and uh, he helped out his son uh, when his son was playing football at GCI and uh, got involved at his uh, at Saginaw Public School. And, and um, one of the interesting things he did was announce the, the, uh, the regional school track meets uh, uh, when he could. And, and imagine having a kind of nice to have a professional broadcaster do that. Um, for someone who's moved around quite a bit and traveled all over the place, and I think he's flown over a million miles in, in airplanes uh, on assignments, he's proud to call Cambridge home. And that's the thing I think he really wanted to drive, drive home today is, is just the, the, his, his sense of um, being a part of this community, his pride at being selected as an inductee uh, into the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame. And um, he and his wife, uh, they're looking forward to uh, continuing their involvement in the community for years to come. Thank you very much. I'm back. <laughs> uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Victoria Moores to uh, turn her camera on now. Victoria Moores, as she began her gymnastics career at an early age, first with the Cambridge Kipps Gymnastics Club, which had been founded by Don and Benita Rope, and then to the Dynamo Gymnastics Club, where she went on to become a world-class competitor. In 2010, Moores competed at Elite Canada in Gatineau, Quebec, and won the all-around competition, placing first on vault, first on uneven bars, and first on floor. This was, uh, this was important uh, of things to come. In May 2011, Moores won, on the all, won the all all around title at the Canadian Championships in Charleston PEI. There, she placed first on uneven bars, first on floor, and third on vault. 2012, that became a very busy year for Moores. In January, she competed at the London Prepares Series, where Canada placed second on the qual and qualified a full team to the 2012 Summer Olympics in London, England. In February, Moores competed at the Elite Canada Meet. There, she placed third on the uneven bars final, first in floor, and third in the all-around competition. At the beginning of March, Morse placed fourth at the American Cup in New York City and later that month competed at the, the Pacific Rim Championships in Everett, Washington, contributing to the Canadian team's bronze medal. Competing in April, she won the silver medal on the floor final at the Artistic Gymnastics Worlds in Zebo, China. At the Canadian Championships in May, Morse tied for the silver medal in the all-around competition. That summer, she hoped to be part of the five-member team that would represent Canada at the Olympics in London, England. At the end of June, Moore's hard work and outstanding performance paid off, earning her a spot to compete at the final Olympic selection meet in Gatineau. Based on her performance there and at the Canadian Championships, she was selected to be part of Canada's Olympic team. At the Olympics in London, Moore's contributed scores of 13.7 7-0 on uneven bars and 14.600 on floor towards the Canadian team's fifth place finish. Moore said, our goal was to finish in the top eight, but finishing fifth, well, we weren't expecting that. We upset a lot of big countries. We just decided to go out there and go strong. In March, 2013, Moore's won the bronze medal in all around competing for Canada at the, at the FIG World Cup, also known as the America Cup. In August, Moores was the first female gymnast to perform a double twisting double layout in international competition during her floor exercise routine at the Pan American Senior Apparatus Championship. At that time, it was the only one skill, the newest and most difficult classification in women's floor, and is now called the Moores. In January, Moores, was, uh, Moores announced, announced as a competitor at the 2014 American Cup, and in early February was named to the Canadian team that would compete at the Tokyo World Cup in 2014. In May 30, on May 31st, 2015, Victoria Moores announced her retirement from the sport, ending one of the most outstanding careers by a Cambridge gymnast and also signaled an end to the career of one of Canada's best ever gymnasts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 2020 inductee into the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame, Victoria Moores. And I ask now that Victoria, you can turn on your microphone. Thank you, Daryl. That was lovely. Well, I would like to take this opportunity to personally thank members of the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame for nominating me. It's such an honor and a privilege to be considered and counted among the great many athletes who have called Cambridge home. It's amazing when I think back to all the amazing things, gymnastics and sport in general, but mo what has brought to my life, I am 
24 years old and gymnastics has been a part of my life for 21 of them. And as an athlete and now as a coach, I got involved in gymnastics when I was barely three years old. I was a bouncy kid. So my mom enrolled me in a local recreational gymnastics class, looking for an outlet for my boundless energy. And quite honestly, as a way to save the furniture. I have to say though, while all the medals and experiences competing around the world have been life-changing and now created memories that will last a lifetime, the real rewards come with coaching gymnastics. There's just something so special about watching new generations of young athletes fall in love with gymnastics and all the benefits of the sport. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, I would like now to ask Paul Ross to uh, Please turn on his camera. Oh, I love this guy. For nearly eight decades, Paul Ross has played a pivotal role in the sporting life of Cambridge, from his earliest days as a sport enthusiast and later as an administrator and member of several sports organizations. At the age of 12, Paul played Pee Wee hockey at the Haspler Arena until the new Preston Arena was built. There, his association with equipment manager, Dunk Pollock, began. Before each game, he would assist Pollock in retrieving sweaters and goaltender equipment from the storage lockers. He would then suit up for his game and afterwards refold the sweaters from both teams, collect the goaltending equipment, and return them to the storage lockers. It was Pollock who convinced Ross at age 18 to join the Preston Boys Hockey Association executive as treasurer. In 1958, he was instrumental in getting volunteers for a novice hockey tournament, which continues to this day. Ross spent 10 years holding various executive positions, as well as coach, manager, and trainer with the Preston Boys Hockey Association. In 1960, he became secretary of the Preston Powell Junior Sea Hockey Club, where he spent four years organizing various fundraising events and other functions. The club changed its name to the Preston Raiders Junior B Club, where he spent five years performing numerous functions. In 1964, Ross, along with Tom Watkins Sr., the co-founder of the ORHA, Preston Jester hockey team, and in 1968, the team won the ORHA Intermediate and Senior titles. In 1978, Ross began a 25-year involvement with the Hespler Minor Hockey Association, holding many executive positions in that time, and in 1988, became president where he remained for four years. During that time, the Hespler Memorial Arena was condemned, along with uh, Brian Flanagan and Ron Schindler from Preston, organized a Preston Hespler Interlocking House League with teams from each center enjoying non-contact competition. The three also organized a successful juvenile interlocking house league with the Galt Minor Hockey Association. Ross also volunteered with the Hespler Minor Hockey Olympics uh, as an announcer and a timekeeper as well as a scorekeeper. After joining the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame Committee in 1996, Ross worked with the Morgard Property Management in designing the current displays in the Cambridge Center. He served as secretary, treasurer, induction ceremony chairman and was a key member on various subcommittees and uh, we all agree an all-around awesome dude ladies and gentlemen please welcome 2020 inductee into the cambridge sports hall of fame paul ross and i ask you now paul to turn on your camera thank you daryl honored guests fellow inductees members of the selection committee ladies and gentlemen um, my life has been an interesting journey that has provided me with the opportunity to meet a lot of wonderful people. They include politicians, dignitaries, sports heroes, and terrific volunteers on different executives and significant committees. I couldn't have accomplished my endeavors without the assistance of all these great people and organizations. I want to start by thanking my wonderful wife, Fiona, of 55 years, and my two boys, Trevor and Justin, for their support and kind consideration for making my journey so successful. I need to thank the late Dunk Pollock for his efforts to show me how to share responsibilities at a young age. He encouraged me to join the Preston Boys Hockey Association Executive at age 18 as treasurer. This association led to my participation in a significant and an important executive vote that involved the decision to host a novice hockey tournament, which exists to this day, 63 years later. The first tournament conducted with volunteers. I need to thank the original organizers, Walter, Byrne, and Ron Gowing, plus the late Bob Whitaker. 
Also my late brother Peter and late Ed Burr for assisting me in refereeing and scorekeeping the eight team tournament. John McCash eventually assumed responsibility and the annual tournament has blossomed to over a hundred teams. I need to extend a special appreciation to the late Bob Betke, Wally McKay and Bob's Montreal counterpart, Emile, for their intuitive thinking during the Quebec separation crisis that we should host an exchange hockey game that would demonstrate to the Quebecers that separation was not an acceptable option for fellow Canadians. Even the great Maurice Rocker Richard attended the St. Vincent de Paul hockey exhibition game in support of our endeavors. I need to thank my lifelong friend, Ron Bowman, for his effort and support in assisting in this special exchange game as a chaperone. He and I eventually went on to coach and manage the same boys from this team in midget and juvenile travel teams. I need to mention the late Vic Laurie, Ross Worley and Jim Sinclair for their dedication to the Preston Raiders hockey executive. Many thanks go to the late Tom Watkins Sr. for assisting me in forming the Preston Jester Rural Intermediate Hockey Team. Thank you to the late Jeff Lilly who assisted me in forming the Hesper Old Timers Hockey Club. And a special thanks goes to Bill Burgess and, the, and Ed Burr for their dedication to our annual Old Timer Tournament. Many thanks go to Ross McKellar for assisting me in forming the Galt Press and Hester Old Timer team that exists to this day. It's when I was president of the Hester Minor Hockey and the Hester Arena was condemned, Hester Minor Hockey united with Preston and Galt Minor Hockey House Leagues to form an interlocking hockey schedule for one season. Thanks to Brian Flanagan Hessler, Ron Schindler Preston, and Keith Taylor Galt, the consolidated hockey schedule was an overwhelming success. I headed the Twin Pad Committee, and a special thanks goes to George Schiedel, owner of Schiedel Construction, for offering his land on Holiday Inn Drive, opposite Jacob Hesper High School, free of charge, to construct a twin pad that could eventually house a Cambridge sportsplex. He wanted to give something back to the community that made his company so successful. A special thank you goes to Jan McGraw, principal of Jacob Hesper High School, and Mr. Schluter, head of the Waterloo District School Board, for their support for a twin pad on the Sheetal land. The Cambridge City Council of the day vetoed the idea into oblivion. And it wasn't until Mayor Jane Brewer was elected 10 years later that the second pad was finally built. Special thanks to the late Al Finley and Dave Maneri for their invitation to have me join the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame executive. Coincidentally, at that time, a suggestion was made that the hall should be included with the revamp of Cambridge Center. Moorguard Holdings were very receptive to the idea and plans were put in place to allocate an area near the new rink. At that, I have to thank consultant Mike Mihak, who assisted me in the floor plan and installation of the power and other facilities. Tracy Leonard and Monique Marceau from Cambridge Center Management for their continued support throughout the 23 years of the Hall of Fame. Kudos to Rick Murphy of D3 Artworks for his design and construction of lifelike figures installed in the various display cases. I also have to recognize Al Finley, Jim Cox, Cam Allen, Dave Maneri, and Mark Hunterford for their devoted efforts to organize and establish the Sports Hall of Fame displays. A thank you goes to Chris Birch for her assistance in helping me organize the, the induction ceremony, and to fellow committee members Bob House and John Rothwell for taking over the induction ceremony responsibility. Thank you, Dave Maneri and Jim Cox for your timeless efforts to organize memorabilia and write-ups regarding the incoming inductees. And I need to thank Dave Willick for his dedication to the selection committee. And, and to Gary Hedges and the, the remainder of the executive for all the wonderful work that they're doing. And last but not least, thank you to all my family, friends and acquaintances who in some way have contributed to my successful journey. Thank you. Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame. Thank you, Paul. I'd like to now ask Sherry Adams to please turn on her camera. For three years from 2015 to 2017, the Cambridge Ring at Turbos had a remarkable run winning three consecutive national championships. 
During those three years, a dozen players carried over from year to year and formed the nucleus of those championship teams. The 12 players include Taylor Campbell, Melissa Breslin, Jenna Dupuy, Sydney and Paige Nozel, Danny Walser, Jacqueline Wise, Sherry Adams, Sam McCullough, Sydney Granger, Jennifer and Jacqueline Godet, and Sharon Walters. The Godet sisters were also members of uh, the Team Canada senior team in 2002 when Canada won the World Ringette Championship and, along with Cheryl and Walters, were members of the 2007 Cambridge Turbos who won the World Club Championships in Sault Ste. Marie, defeating the Finnish Elite League champions 4-2. Along the way came many challenges. The first was a, disappearing, uh, was a disappointing loss to the Ottawa team in 2013-14 at the national championships, but it set the stage for the 2014-15 season, which saw the Turbos win the first of three consecutive titles. This brought Cambridge's medal count at 11 nationals to six gold, three silver, and one bronze. In each of the four seasons, starting with the 2014 loss to Ottawa, the Turbos qualified first in the highly competitive East Division each season. Now, in 2015, Cambridge defeated Richmond Hill in the final. In 2016, they defeated Gloucester, and in 2017, they defeated the Atlantic Attack. The team suffered a serious setback the following season, vying for their fourth consecutive national title when their head coach, Kevin Lee, passed away. Lee had guided the team in the final year of their three-year championship run. In 2020, Lee was inducted into the Ringette Hall of Fame as a referee. He was a level-headed man, said team manager Bud Godet. Godet still believes the team would have won a fourth national title under the guidance of Lee. Why were the teams so successful? They were just scary good, said Godette. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 2020 inductees into the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame, the 2015, 16, and 17 Turbos. And I now ask team member Sherry Adams to speak on their behalf of the teams and uh, please turn her microphone on. Thank you, Daryl. First of all, I'd like to congratulate all of the inducted members today. It's an honor to be among you. I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for making this all possible despite these unusual times. I was fortunate to be a part of the Cambridge Turbos that won three gold national med medals at the Canadian Ringette Championships, what our team more commonly knows as the three P. Everyone listed by Daryl is so well deserving of this induction and I'm so proud of all of them. The memories of this three P go far beyond the three gold medals that hang on our necks. We have created bonds that last a lifetime. The winds were spectacular, but the dressing room laughs, dances, chirps, and lectures I will always cherish. The traveling across the country, the hotel room hangouts, and the endless team bonding is much more memorial than the three-peat. The three-peat accomplished our goals, but the experience grew us as athletes, teammates, friends, and mostly as a turbo family. I would also like to give a special thank you to Glenn Gaudet, who is the heart and soul of the Cambridge Turbos. He has dedicated numerous hours as a coach and more recently as a manager to this association and none of the success would have been possible without him. I would also like to make an honorable mention to our late coach, Kevin Lee. Kevin led us to the last gold medal. The Turbos have won and he sealed the three-peat and helped the Turbos achieve NRL history along with this induction to the Cambridge Hall of Fame. I think I speak on behalf of the whole Turbos organization with gratitude for today's induction. When I recently watched the Netflix documentary, The Last Dance with Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls and the accomplishment of their NBA three-peat, I couldn't help but feel the love for my Turbo family. Although we may not have the clout of the Chicago Bulls, we all know our experience and memories were just as meaningful as theirs. Thank you again to everyone who has made this possible and congratulations to everyone inducted today. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, I would like to now call on Dave Maneri from the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame for a special tribute and ask him to please turn on his camera and microphone. I think you have yourself muted, Dave. No, it <laughs> there you somehow, go. somehow it muted on its own there, Daryl. Um, I was just saying thank you, Sherry. It was a very uh, touching uh, uh, tribute you had for the, the those teams, the three peat. Um, we're here today, uh, the first Saturday in May. It's a Kentucky Derby Saturday, uh, but it's also the, the the Saturday that we always have our Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And uh, and there's one person that's not with us today for the first time since we began these inductions back in 1998. 
and that's Al Finley. And most of you know Al, uh, some of you might not, uh, but I'm just giving you a little uh, sense of what Al meant, uh, not only to me, but to, to so many people, I think, in the, in the community. Um, he, he was known and loved by so many of you, and, and um, each of you will have your own uh, memories, only unique mem memories of this wonderful man. Uh, but since we started planning the sports hall back in the mid-1990s, um, and uh, Al was there from the, the very beginning, and, and uh, the, um, this is, as I say, the first time he's not here, it's a, it, I mean, it is a strange time with COVID, but also, I think, for our, the people on our Sports Hall of Fame, uh, committee and uh, so forth, and not having him present uh, for the ceremony. And uh, um, he, he was not only just a fixture in the community, um, but, but a cherished friend to, to so many people. He died last December uh, and left behind uh, his beloved wife and life partner, Donna, and, and his two children, Mark and Chris, and their families. But he also left behind a, an entire community that was mourning his loss uh, because uh, he was known so well in the community by so many people. Um, there is a tribute to Al in our induction program and I would encourage you to, to download it. It's a free download on our Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame website and you can read about him and read the tributes by several of his friends and, and their recollections and, and so forth. Um, it, it's, uh, so, so take a look at it and you'll also see all the, um, all the bios of each of our inductees today. And, and so that'll be a nice keepsake. If we were meeting in person, you could get a hard copy, but in lieu of that, um, please download the PDF that we have on our website. Al came to, to Preston, uh, in 1959 and, um, he was a good athlete, a young guy then. Uh, when his family moved here. And over the, the next 60 years, he was involved in so many different aspects of the community, uh, volunteering and, and so many different things. And I, I, I couldn't possibly begin to, to go over everything and, and, and the different tributes and, and um, recollections of, of, of people. But um, I did talk to Kerry Leach, uh, the, the figure skating uh, coach uh, and a longtime friend of Al and, and and, um, and uh, Carrie Leach said Al was not only a wonderful family mem member and a family man and a cherished friend, but he, he was also uh, a legend in the sports community. And he said a lot of people don't know that Al was a, a real business entrepreneur. Um, and um, there, was, there was one time, you know, Al, if you knew Al, of course, you, you could have a, a, a kind of a funny relationship in terms of you might say something and he could respond to it and and you were just joking he didn't mean there might have been funny words spoken and and so forth but it was all in good jest and that's the kind of relationship that uh, carrie and al had and uh, so al decided to to print up it started his own clothing line and and it, and it was the i hate carrie leach uh, clothing line that and carrie told me this story he printed up these sh the t-shirts i hate carrie leach they went like hotcakes. All Carrie Leach's skaters bought them, and other people bought them, and uh, they, they were hugely popular. Um, another longtime friend, Ed Heather, mentioned that uh, when Al was working at the Preston Arena in the early days, uh, he, he was probably the most popular Zamboni driver in all of North America. I mean, there probably wasn't anybody that was more popular in his area than Al was here as a Zamboni driver and as just as a, a person in the community and a, a contributor. Um, he was an extraordinary person who in, got people around him involved in things and and brought out the best in other people. I mean, he, he had a committed following of people with the hockey school, but also with the Sports Hall of Fame. And, and you know, that's, that's what I'm just focusing on here is, is really his, his contributions to the Sports Hall of Fame. And so when he and, and Cam Allen and I started thinking of this idea, I mean, the, Al was so committed and so passionate and it took that to get things going. I mean, he, he was the type of person that would think about the Sports Hall of Fame um, almost 24 hours a day. And, and, you know, this year, even though he can't be here with us today, um, Al knew all the, of the inductees that are being inducted today. 
and uh, and this was all. This was the day that it was the highlight of the whole, certainly the Sports Hall of Fame calendar, but also the highlight really of, of the year in the sports community because. Um, and as we've seen today, some of the, the, the people coming back and, and being um, inducted, they, they, they have a chance to thank people, as Tim Brent said, that maybe don't get thanked enough. And it's a moving experience for the inductees to, to be inducted in their community sports hall of fame. And, and I think many of our inductees have mentioned that today. Um, the Al stepped aside from the Sports Hall of Fame as he got a bit older and, and was slowing down a little bit um, and he stepped off the executive committee, but he never left the Sports Hall of Fame. He was in touch with everybody on the committee. He was still involved in different aspects of the Sports Hall of Fame behind the scenes uh, and the memorabilia and the collections and and uh, the, the inductions. And uh, so he was still integrally involved in, in the whole thing, even though he wasn't officially on the, on the, in the committee. But there was one time I just wanted to relate to you uh, that stands out most prominently in my memory um, for Al and of Al was during our first induction ceremony. It was it, it was it, it, the first Saturday in May of 1988, or I'm sorry, 1998. And one of the inductees at that time was Hilda Ranscombe, who was nearing the end of her life. And Hilda uh, at that point, you know, Hilda, for those of you that don't know, was re widely regarded as, as, as the greatest female hockey player of her era, if not the, one of the greatest female hockey players of all time. And But she had suffered from diabetes in, in old age, and she'd lost her legs. And so she had to come by wheelchair that day, and she was brought by Betty Barnes, her niece. And it was quite a circuitous trip to, just to get to the Cambridge Center for the induction ceremony. When Al presented Hilda with her plaque as one of that, the inaugural inductees for the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame, uh, Hilda had tears in her eyes and it was, it was just such a moving thing to see and Al did too. And there's a photograph of Al presenting her, her uh, plaque, uh, to, the, the plaque to Hilda and uh, it captures it perfectly. And uh, that's, that's one of my favorite photographs that I, I just love to, to, to look at and can't see enough. Um, th there was never a time, as all his friends know, when you couldn't pick up the phone and call Al. And, and I think that's one of the things that everybody misses is his presence. As, uh, he was always there if you needed to talk, you needed to ask advice or run something by him or just to chat or to get together for breakfast and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and gab a, a little bit. Um, Near the end, Al asked me if I could write something about his life. He, he knew that the end was coming and, um, and I prepared some things and the, what I prepared was really the basis of what is in the, our induction booklet. Um, and uh, we didn't know where it was gonna go or what was gonna, who would ever see it, but, but this is where it is. And it's, uh, so I'd encourage you to t take a look at that. A finer man you couldn't find. Um, and and uh, you know, we're all poorer at his having passed away, uh, but really this is so true. Uh, and we say this, uh, you know, for a lot of people who have passed on, uh, but you know, our memories of Al and, and, and who he was and his example and the strength that we can draw from him is are going to stay long with us. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, uh, Daryl. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I would now like to call on Gary Hedges, the chairman of the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame for his comments. And I will turn things over to you and ask you to turn your microphone on. Well, good afternoon and welcome to our induction ceremony. Um, I wanna just say a few words I can about the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, our mission is faithfully carried on by a dedicated group of long serving volunteers. And you've certainly heard from a couple of them uh, today. We're a registered charity and we encourage and appreciate donations and in-kind contributions to help paying ongoing costs, operate our annual induction ceremony, and to provide scholarships to graduating athletes and leaders from the eight high schools in the community. This year we have partnered with BrokerLink Insurance who will provide a $500 scholarship for one student from each of the eight high schools. And two of those eight students will each receive an additional $3,000 scholarship from the Bob Cunningham Foundation. 
Our three annual fundraisers are the golf tournament, a Hamilton Family Theater event, and a raffle for sports memorabilia from the NHLPA. And as we all know, on uh, due this year, this year due to COVID, where we had to postpone, or possibly we will have to cancel these events, which is just unfortunate because with the golf tournament, it's a lot of fun and it's our main fundraiser, but it is what it is. We'd also like to thank the Cambridge Bingo Center for their ongoing and generous and kind support. The, the money that we've been able to generate from Bingo Center has really helped us through this COVID era. Uh, the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame would like to extend their appreciation to Tim Hortons, Canadian General Tower, Waterloo Regional Heritage Foundation, Toyota Motor Manufacturing Inc., Earl Sage, and the Canamera Games for sponsoring our display cases, which you see in the Cambridge Center. And we'd really like to thank Morgard for allowing us to house our Sports Hall of Fame displays in the Cambridge Center, as Paul Ross indicated the process he went through to help get us there. And personally, I would like to thank Dave and Ari and Jim Cox for their time and effort preparing plaques and programs and everything that they do. And Al Robertson and his wife, Linda, for our inductive, supply, inductive displays, excuse me. And Bob Howison and John Rothwell for all the work they've done in planning and presenting this event. I think when we met earlier before this went live, I think he said they've had about 100 sessions, which is kind of unbelievable. And we have our, our, our monthly meetings by uh, Zoom, and some of those don't seem to work very well, and this one seems to have worked very, very well. So uh, it, this is a great day, uh, in my opinion. I want to thank those who registered for this year's virtual induction ceremony, and you can follow us on cambridgeshf.com or on Twitter and on Facebook. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Daryl Law from Dave FM for his continued and dedicated efforts in emceeing our annual event. And I'll turn this back to Daryl. Thank you for the uh, kind words, Gary. And uh, thank you. It's an honor for me every year. Uh, I missed last year, obviously. We all did because of the, uh, the COVID situation. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm truly honored to do this, and I, and I believe so much in, in the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame, and, and thank you for all the work the volunteers and the organizers do. You guys, it's just fantastic. Um, also, uh, we pulled this one off. This was good. We weren't sure how it was going to go, and uh, pretty much without a hitch. So uh, congratulations to all. And congratulations, of course, to this year's inductees. Thank you to our honored guests for taking time from your busy schedules to attend. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And we will see you again next year at the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame induction ceremonies. Have a great day and stay safe. For more highlights, visit our website, 519sportsonline.ca. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.